Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. Uh, I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, in the 80s and early 90s, Norway unleashed a new genre of music that has gone on to influence countless metal acts since. since. It was called uh, Norwegian black metal, really a subgenre of black metal, which had started prior to that. But with that genre of music, it spawned a scene that also spawned a series of crimes, from vandalism to murder. The new film, Lords of Chaos by director Jonas Ackerland uh, covers those crimes as well as that scene incredibly well with insane detail because the director himself was part of a neighboring country that was also part of a black metal scene. He was in a band called Bathory. The film is heartbreaking, kind of beautiful, kind of amazing. It's pretty great. Let's check out the trailer for Lords of Chaos. Everybody, please welcome from Lords of Chaos, Emery Cohen, Rory Culkin, and writer-director Jonas Ackerland. Hey. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on the, on the film. Uh, I want to dive right into what I was struck by so much about the film, uh, a number of things, but mostly was your ability to sort of deconstruct the myth or the idea that we would have about these guys and this scene and to make them kids, to make them confused kids and kids who weren't necessarily in control of everything they're doing. I think a lesser filmmaker or someone who just revered the scene would make something that reveled in the myth of black metal and in the myth of darkness and, and, and gore and mayhem, and you find this way to sort of just show that they were confused, scared, stupid, kind of crazy kids. Was that your intention going into the movie initially? Um, I guess so, yeah. I mean, there, there's already been so many documents and move, uh, documentaries and books and stories around this story, but the one thing they all have in common is that they portrait monsters and demons, and it's always like fire and a deep voice telling the story. And I thought, they were very young, and we haven't really talked about that. And we, they were humans, and they came from pretty good upbringings. And, uh, you know, something happened within this group that everything just went wrong. And I was trying to figure out what that was. What do you think it was? No, I, I don't know. It's impossible to say. This is my perspective, this movie. It's obviously like how we saw it. And, uh, um, but I think something happened when they started to stop thinking as individuals and started to think like a group and took some pretty bad decisions, obviously. You make, uh, you make reference, I believe, twice you call out the movie, not call it out, excuse me, but you reference the movie Dead Alive, the Peter Jackson uh, sort of gore film from the mid-90s. And I'm not sure if that was just there because someone would be watching it, but what I saw that was was this juxtaposition between the fantasy and the fun idea of what gore was and then the reality as to what happened to them and what they were actually living. Was there any reason for it, or was that just what they yeah, would no, be it's watching? Part of, it's part of the era. You know, it came from, you know, a lot of dark music and a lot of dark movies, and, you know, that sense of humor was, was there. But, uh, I mean, obviously these kids couldn't really separate the fantasy from the reality, yeah. but uh, I don't think it had anything to do with those movies. Oh, no, I don't either. Excuse me. I wasn't trying to blame right. Dead Alive right. uh, at, at all. Um, Roy, can you talk to me about uh, Euronymous, this character that you play, and any sort of information you were able to dig up about him? I mean, I know that Jonas, maybe you might have, you didn't know him prior to, you didn't know him at all, right? So what sort of research did you do to find out about this character? With Euronymous, I mean, there's, I spoke to people that, that hung out with him at the time, and, and uh, you know, there's so many photos of these guys. They were really good at documenting themselves. Um, so it was a lot of photographs and Jonas even made a, uh, a picture script. It was like a 400 page script and every scene, 600, 600 excuse me. And uh, every scene was assigned like a photo that sort of represented, you know, from that time that, um, so there was a lot to work with. And, it, you know, at first it's sort of hard to keep track of all of these characters with names like Hellhammer and Necro Butcher and like, you know, things like that. But once I got to, you know, it was the photos that was the, the, the most important to me. Um, because when Euronymous was posing in the photos, he was trying to look scary and he was trying to look evil. But when you would see him in the background of the photos, he was like a little sweetie and he was like giggling and stuff like that. So it's like interesting to try to piece that together. You know what I mean? What he wanted to show the world and then what he really was, which I think was just like a bit of a sweetheart. I don't know. And like a bit of a rabble rouser. He wasn't expecting this to go as far as it did. Right. He was, you know, he was a he self -proclaim, self proclaimed leader of of you know Norwegian black metal and and um. You know, there's something fun to that, you know, uh, moving heavy things without lifting a finger and, you know, things like that. I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty fun to have a 
a crew of giant long haired dudes to do your bidding, you know, I'm into it. Uh, Jonas, you've been trying to make this movie for a number of years, right? Um, yeah, in different forms. I, I had the idea way back that there's something special with this story and I wanted to kind of like capture that somehow in a movie. But then I've been like on and off for, for like almost 15, 20 years thinking about this. Uh, but I seriously started thinking about it like six years ago when I wrote, started to write the script. So, and it's been a pretty long uphill journey to get it made, to be honest. Was it something that you was personal for you be, because you were part of a black metal scene? Obviously not in Norway, but nearby Sweden. Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think I went through what a lot of other people went through with this story. This story kind of grabs you and you... Uh, a lot of people out there think they own this story. They think it's more important than them than anybody else. It's it's really one of those stories that people are very sensitive about. Mm. And I, I was the same uh, before I realized it's just, you know, a story that we kind of seen before. It's a, know, way, it's a true crime wayward youth story. Yeah, but in a weird way, it grabs a lot of people. There's a ton of people who wasn't even born when this happened that has a lot of opinions about it and think they own it. It's like their story. Yeah. Um, so it, in a weird way, it, grabs, it grabs you, and it grabbed me for sure, definitely. Uh, Emery, you play v Varg, right? Varg. Excuse, Varg. Vard or Varg? Varg. Varg, with a G, thank you, sorry, who, uh, you know, is the lead singer of Burza, Burzum mm -hmm. and ended up going to prison uh, for mm -hmm. the murder of Euronymous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have a lot more that I think you can work with in terms of research. He releases videos on YouTube yeah. all the time now. Yeah. Did you want to look at those, or did you want to think of no, this, this I, I wa behind? I watched a couple of, of those, but I really was more interested in getting... Uh, a sense of him as a younger guy, you know, because also in his videos now, like you said, he's he's gone to prison. He's seen as someone who's as a murderer essentially, and so it's like that's a different human being, I, I think. And um, so, f you know, that documentary "Until the Darkness Takes" is what's the one? It's it's a documentary about this. I had watched that years ago for just for pleasure and stuff. And then I just the one thing I took from Varg, I was watching him in prison. He has this kind of strut, you know? He has this weird kind of strut that he does and this weird kind of way of sitting. And that, that was what I got most from the videos, you know what I mean? Because also, you gotta, you gotta discount, you know, you, as an actor, you gotta figure out how to make it personal for you, you know? And for me, there's nothing about going hail Satan and stuff that's personal to me, you know? So I had to figure out what was different. You know, I had to make all that like a different thing in my head anyway, you know? Yeah, there is also the idea that he is a may be a completely different person after having murdered somebody. There's the toughness that you think you are and uh, the, the shell that you put up when you're threatening to do something, and then afterwards you do it and you recognize the consequences of it. Yeah. You could be a completely different yeah, person. Yeah, well, but also I think... That he is. Like, he seems no, no, but I think the character, the character in, a, in the film yeah. grows into the person who then becomes putting up the tough... You know, he doesn't just start by burning down churches. He starts really as a super fan yeah. who's going up to Euronymous... In the in in what was it, a donor shop or something, and he's like uh, scorpions patch, right? Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. He wants to be with the, he wants to be one of the guys, you know, and that person to then becoming one of the guys, which he takes very seriously, to then burning down churches, to then who he is after he burns down the church. That's a different person too. I felt so. There's a lot, you know. I was focused more on the that period of his life, and not what he's not what he's saying now. No. Um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say because it's based on a thing that actually happened that there is a murder in the in the movie, a couple, and uh, you play uh, a character that gets murdered. And I think in what I think is one of the most harrowing uh, murder scenes I've ever seen committed to movies. I think you did such an amazing job taking us completely out of any of the fun gore myth that black metal may have and say, no, murder is real. This is what it looks like, and this is how it affects somebody. And you guys, your performances in that scene, it's, it's really hard to watch, and it's important that it's hard to watch. Can you talk about shooting that? Yeah. Um, I was, uh, that was the one scene I was sort of concerned about, and we sort of saved it till the end. And, um, you know, Emery comes bursting through my front door, and he's really intense. Uh, and he's, you know, he's tearing up, and he's, you know, and sort of threw me off, um, but appropriately. And that was sort of the idea. And then, and then as he, you know, pulls out the knife, and and uh, then I think we sort of picked up momentum. And um, you know, he really, he really beat me up that night. 
Uh, I didn't mean to. I was I was bruised all over my back. You weren't bruised I, all over your back. You I heard about it I later. I heard about it. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to. But look, but now I can appreciate. tell you that you you uh, you really went for it, which I appreciate because it you know it it's, uh, it translated well, I think. So thank you. Are you still my friend? Yeah, we're friends. Yeah. yeah. Hey Jonas, uh, <laughs> when you decided to do this movie, when did you know that those scenes had to be as as grisly and as true to life as possible? Well, I kind of had that attitude to everything in the movie. I wanted to be as true to the as I possibly could to but everything. In that scene, the suicide scene as well. I mean, yeah. whenever something really tragic happens, you do such a great job of saying of taking us away from this black metal death focused scene and being like, no, actual death is very real and it looks like this versus the fantasy that they have. Yeah, no, so again, I was, I was trying to be as true as I possibly could to what really happened. And this, these extreme ups and downs in this story is very important to, you know, feeling for the characters and understanding. Uh, the, the good thing, uh, like Rory said, they were very good at taking pictures. There was a lot of research material for us. And the, for the murder scenes, there was the police reports. So those were actually the easiest ones for me to research. I knew what happened. I knew how it happened. So I, that was easy kind of like to, to, to follow that. But uh, what about your decision to not look away at any point, to follow through? I mean, because really, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe you, th you feel like it's just another murder scene. I watch a lot of movies. I watch a lot of true crime stuff. Rarely does a director follow through on what a murder may actually look like, especially a stabbing to death. Mm. Well, <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, no. Um, no, and again, I just wanted it to be as as real as I possibly could. And we shot it like old school too. It's like all like pumps and bloods and prosthetics and like so we did it like very old school way, which kind of makes it look even better, I think. And harder to shoot these days as as well, right? Yeah, I mean we shot this movie in eighteen days and You shot this movie in eighteen days? Yeah, and uh, the the murder scene that we oh, did at the end was almost two days. Was it two days? Yeah, almost two days. We shot a few other things. The apartment was one, and then when we oh, still yeah, out into yeah, the stable, yeah. was the other day. Yeah, so, I mean, so... Is that because you're essentially clean... After every take, you have to clean up, or did you find a way to shoot it so you could kind of progressively go uh, it was, rather it was, than... It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a nine-minute murder scene yeah. with dialogue and a lot of special effects. So it takes a little time. But, you know, all the other stuff we shot, like the, all the church burnings we shot in a day and, like, all those things, we just, like, we were fast... What was it like shooting this movie that fast? Um, you know, I'd, I'd been following the script for a long time, so I, I had sort of been doing my studying for a while, so I, I felt sort of prepared when we when we went. But um, going back to the, the murder scene, so, you know, as like you said, it really happened. Uh, Varg first stabbed Euronymous in his apartment, but then it ended up a few floors down. So you know they had to be talking to each other. You know, they had there had to be... An interaction, you know, and that sort of just humanizes it too. That it wasn't in one corner of an apartment; it it, it spanned the whole the building. Um, so there had to be moments of like stop, you know, and trying to reason with him, and, and that's you know that's that's sort of heartbreaking. But um, yeah, you're pleading. You're you're. It's, he had to. It's an incredible moment. Right. Yeah. 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 It's it's heavy heavy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What was that like? Shoot. What was it like shooting that for you? For me. Yeah, just being um, a monster. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, the. I saw, I, I saw, at that point in the script, I saw Varg as someone who was really hurt and angry by his best friend. I, under, I can understand that. I don't understand stabbing a guy 25 times, but I understand being hurt and angry. And then, you know, the rest of the stuff, I mean, that's, that's what we do for, for a living, you know what I mean? And, and like Jonas said, the way it was old school, the way we were shooting it, and it was also technical sometimes because of that. And so... I mean, it was definitely a harder day for Rory. <laughs> 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 you know, I had a, fun, I could have a little bit of enjoy. I mean, not enjoyment, but you know, I'm acting. You know, so, you know, I realized that this is imaginary for us. You know what I mean? And I wanted, I wanted him to be hurt. I thought Varg was hurt at that point. I didn't want it to just be this angry ma young man coming to wreak havoc. I wanted it to be kind of more like a hurt little boy acting out towards his childhood best friend. You know, like when, when, when you would get into it with your best friend, like all of a sudden you would like maybe shove the guy or maybe even like punch yeah. or something and, and you felt horrible, except times, you know, a lot more. 
I think that's the kind of the end, the end interpretation we get of Varg that actually lasts into potentially who the man is now, which is a kind of like a little boy desperate for attention that's yeah. somewhat narcissistic and always finding an angle to get yeah. the attention that he's looking for. Which well, that's what was what with, with the burning down the churches. You know, I think I th- the way I saw it, I think Varg knew that Euronymous wasn't serious, but he wanted the attention of being the true you know, the true guy in it, you know? I, I think that that was m- more for attention than to really, you know, burn down a church, you know? Uh, you know, one of the things that I think your movie does that oftentimes isn't done when people talk about this is people end up in some ways, whether they mean to or not, kind of celebrating Burz, um, Varg, even though he's a murderer because he becomes representative of how authentically black metal he is by having followed through in this, but your film celebrates Euronymous. Your film is about the accomplishments of Euronymous in a, in a lot of ways. When did you realize that that was kind of your way in and that was the angle, that, the, the approach that you wanted to have? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm celebrating him. Euronymous was, you know, he was... Not great either, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, they, had, they all had their problems, and especially within the group. They, you know, they were all responsible for what, what they did. Uh, but they were all very creative. They left something behind that, you know, it's really tough to do, you know. You can, uh, and this is pre-internet, you know, they were famous all over the world. That logo, I still see that logo everywhere I go, you know. There's like, you can pay an advertising agency millions to get to that point. But, you know, they, they were really good at getting their stuff out there. And, um, and they left a treasure of music and creativity behind, you know. So that's, that we're celebrating that for sure. Are you surprised at the enduring influence that they, they had on music? Um, not really. I mean, it was, it was good music. Bursum was great. Yeah, I know. The, those couple Bursum albums are yeah, really good. Yeah, you know, in the beginning, it was really good stuff, you know. So, not really. I mean, they, it, was, it was really one of a kind, and they really brought it into, to, you know, they really discovered the sound and really found that sound, and yeah. So. Was it, uh, when, you, when you went into making the film, did you want the look of the movie and everything to be representative of the sound as well? Um... No, not really, but I did use a lot of those pictures that was available uh, as a reference for the look. Um, you know, so we were even on set sometimes just holding up a picture next to a location and trying to make it match, you know. So, and we wanted everything to be, I, w- I didn't want to give the pleasure to all the black metal professors out there to give me shit for having the wrong sneakers and the wrong t-shirts and this and that. So we put, we, we put a lot of effort into making it right. Do black metal professors give you shit? I mean, you are part of an oh, original yeah, yeah, black yeah. metal band. They're turning around a little bit now, but uh, yeah. yeah. Is it because you directed like a Madonna video? They're like, you're not black metal. Uh, I'm not black metal. No, I left the scene a long time ago. So. I'm, a, you, I'm a filmmaker. What made you leave the scene to go make movies? Um, yeah, discovering film editing for sure. Yeah. And how did you even? Uh, how did you? How did you begin in the scene? What started you in 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 black metal? No, I was just playing in different bands, and I met this guy who was incredible. And and me and my cousin, he was a bass player, and we formed this band. And we we kind of did the same, a little bit the same journey as in the beginning of this movie. You know when. Uh, you're struggling to find out your sound and you're drawing your logo and you're trying to find your way in, in music. And we did the same with my band, Bathory, in the beginning. You know, So that's very much the same. Is that for you like th- what you relate to the most in the movie? And then after that one part in the beginning, it tails off into a story uh, that's not yours yeah, at all? Oh yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, that first act was very much like you know the parties and being awkward around girls and trying to figure shit out. That's what we did too. Yeah. Uh, Rory, what drew you to this to this project? You said you've been following the script for a long time. Yeah, um, I guess just the, uh, I mean, initially just the aesthetics, just the like, who is this person in, in strange face paint? And um, I was just excited to deconstruct them, I guess, and, and strip them down because you know you look at photos of these kids and they're hanging out in in dark basements. Uh, painting themselves to look like dead bodies, and and they're you know have chains all over them, and you're it's initially like kind of scary, and I don't want to hang out with these guys, I don't want to be with these guys. Uh, play them. <laughs> I'd like to play them. Yeah, but then but then you you know I quickly tried to break them down, and okay, so they're wearing face paint. Where did they get the face paint? At a Halloween shop. So they're so it's clown makeup. So they're kind of like little clowns. Oh, okay, they're not so scary. And, like I immediately tried to you know strip them down, and and um and then build them back up, and and you know make them intimidating again. Um, but I was just excited to 
try to find out why they were they were doing all this stuff. I mean, like Jonas said, they had you know great upbringing, uh, no, no real reason to lash out the way they did, and I was curious to learn more about it with with Jonas. Um, how did you and Emery develop your relationship? Was it something that just came on set and going off the script? I mean, because there is a very clear dynamic that the two of you have to have right from the beginning of the story as, as it develops. Uh, well, we, like, grew up in the same neighborhood. Yeah, we grew up in the same neighborhood. We had a lot of friends in it that ran in similar circles, but we hadn't really met. Um, and, you know, I think also my philosophy on stuff like this is... Um, get become f friends with the actor make it the friendly part real and let the other stuff be imaginary you know what i mean the anger and all that stuff and you know we spent like two weeks together jamming with uh these we, we call them like death uh, black metal coaches uh and um and um so we were playing music together for like two weeks and and just hanging out and I mean, I, w I, came, I came to the movie because I was a huge fan of Spun, Jonas's movie, and I was a big fan of Rory's work. So for me, it was like, I'm, I, w I wanted to work with Rory, man. And it's like what he was saying, like the, the, the more friendly you are, the, you know, the more you get to know each other, the harder you can go when it, at each other when it Trust comes to... Other. Yeah, exactly. You know, if, when they call cut, you're not going like, Jesus, are we... Right. Do you hate me? Right, yeah. right. We, we gave each other permission to... You know, and he took advantage of, of that. <laughs> <laughs> Who were your black metal coaches? Uh, it was a, a Hungarian band called Bornholm. Um, and they, yeah, they gave us lessons. You know, we had one day off a week, and we would go to rehearse with them on that day off. And um, even aside from the music, they would help us with, you know, just advice. Like, uh, uh, they told me to look at myself in the mirror a lot. You know what I mean? And just pose. And it's, it's interesting, because these guys are... You know, yeah, they have long hair and they wear makeup, but they're ultra masculine. And and for them to say, you know, pose in the mirror, it's just kind of like jarring, and it's uh, it just made it even more fascinating. So yeah, I spent a lot of time in the mirror. Uh, Posing? Sure did. Yeah. What kind of pose? Poses? Oh, nice. Okay. Evil yeah. poses. You know? Evil poses. Yeah. yeah, yeah, evil, yeah. It's been evil a while, poses. But I'm right. a little rusty, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a couple audience questions. Uh, you have a microphone. Hey. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you guys premiered at Sundance. What was that experience like? Um, it was great. Uh, <laughs> you know, Sundance, they have all these, all these great movies going on, and we were kind of the, the weird kids with the church burning movie. Uh, but I think it went well. I don't know. What yeah, no, it was great. It was a really the first time we showed it. We've done a lot of festivals now, and it's, uh, I think it works really well in festivals. People go because they love movies, and it's, it's been, I think we've done over like 40 festivals at this point the last year, yeah. You've done 40 festivals? With yeah, it's been a lot of festivals, yeah. Wow. You know, uh, Emery brought up Spun, and you were here just a, a couple weeks ago with uh, Polar. You're clearly drawn to extremes, whether it's darkly comic extremes like Spun and, and Polar, or just extremes, dramatic extremes. Where do you think that comes from? And also being a black form of black metal musician. Well, I, I do other stuff, too. Oh, what are the nice things that you see all my nice stuff? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. I just like, you know, I, I learned early that, you know, filmmaking is a really good tool to grab you and, and, and really touch you. And uh, I try to do it as uh, much as I can each time I do it. So, I don't know. That's a weird answer, but that's probably the reason why I do it. What are the sweet things that, that, that you do? Oh, I'm you should see my... <laughs> uh, gardening. Uh, yeah. yeah gardening. Uh, one more. Hi, right, my question is for Jonas. Does the movie actually feature any original songs by Mayhem or Burzum, or is it an entirely different soundtrack? No, it has um, um, 11, 11 Mayhem songs okay. in the film. Um, and a few of them are original recordings. Or, but right. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but in the beginning of the movie, they're kind of like rehearsing and they're not playing that well. So we had to re-record them to sound a little bad, you know, like they're learning their instruments. We had to re-record a few for uh, to make it sound live. All right. uh, and then eventually they became better and better, and some of them are or original recordings. We don't have any bursts of music in the film. Um, there's no room for it, really, so okay. we don't have any of that. All right, thank you. 
Um, guys, congratulations on the film. It's a wonderful achievement. I think it's the best this story. You said it, as you said, it's been told. I think this is the best that it's that it's been told, and it probably ever will be. Uh, it comes out today, right? People can see it today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody, give them a big round of applause. Lords of Chaos. Let's hear it. Thank you.